अब मुझे आप कॉल करिए Good afternoon, Professor Call. Good afternoon. Good evening. We are it's our oh, evening it's now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hope you enjoyed the first half of the day here. Yeah, it was it was quite interesting. No, I think all of us were reiterating the same thought, same which we thought. have believed, but we do need leadership. Yeah. Who and thorough professional development of teachers, which will give them confidence. Very true, very true. They have the skills, it needs to be reiterated and retrain them, that's it. <laughs> so how that's was your true. day? Mark that's why we have to have varied uh, different experiences and ideas, and let's see what best can benefit all of us. <laughs> Uh, we we have to take small steps, try it in different nodes, and then based on its success, whatever is successful is to be implemented. Now we are live on uh, YouTube. Uh, we again welcome you on behalf of Mahatma Gandhi Antarashtri Hindi Vishwavidyalaya, Varda, in this two-day national international webinar. And uh, for this session, we have our coordinators, Dr. Silpi Kumari and Dr. Samarjit Yadav. So now I request coordinator of this session, Dr. Silpi Kumari, to take over the session and uh, uh, she will start the proceedings. I welcome Dr. Silpi Kumari. I, Dr. Silpi Kumari, Assistant Professor, Department of Education, on the behalf of the School of Education and uh, Mahatma Gandhi Antirashtriya Hindi Visavidyalaya Vardha, welcome our resource person, the participants of this webinar, our colleagues and students in the second technical session of this international webinar on Alternative Assessment and Evaluation in Teacher Education. This technical session of the webinar will basically focus on concept, reconceptualization of assessment in teacher education and open pedagogy and renewable assessment in teacher education, formative techniques of assessment, assessment in online learning environment, as well as reflective practices should be given adequate space in the process of assessment and evaluation in teacher education program. This session will be chaired by Professor Amrut Ji Kumar, who is currently heading the Department of Education, Central University of Kerala. Let me introduce him. Dr. Amrut Ji Kumar is a research awardee of University Grants Commission, New Delhi. He was awarded with Certificate of Merit for Teaching based on students' assessment for five times consecutively when he was Assistant Professor 
at Pondicherry Central University. He has published four books. He has several research papers for his credit in national and international journals. Presently, he is the project head of Pandit Madan Mohan Malvi, a national mission on teachers and teaching, School of Education, Central University of Kerala. Thus, there is a long list of achievements in, included in his profile. I welcome you, sir, on behalf of the School of Education and MGHV Vardha. We have two eminent speakers in this session. They are experts in their respective field of knowledge. The first speaker is Professor Rekha Bhan Paul, Professor, Science and Mathematics Education, San Selkirtin University, Perth, Australia. Our second speaker is Professor Venisha Denon, Professor of Instruction Systems and Learning Technologies, Florida, Florida State University, Florida, USA. I welcome you, ma'am. Let me introduce our first speaker, Rekha Bhan Paul, ma'am. She belongs to Science and Mathematics Education Center, Perth University, Perth, Australia. Her skills and expertise areas are assessment, learning environment, online learning, collaborative learning, blended learning, e-learning in higher education, and teacher education. She has currently 35 publications in several reputed journals, 15,017 reads of her publications, and 231 citations. This data has been collected from database of the research gate. I welcome you, ma'am, once again. Let me invite you for your lecture on the, on the topic, reconceptualizing assessment in teacher education. Over to you, ma'am, Professor Rekha Bhan Paul, ma'am. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. We are okay. very much let me let me uh, yeah you are audible you are audible ma'am yeah i'm sharing my presentation okay okay that's um <laughs> Uh, can you? I can't see anything on my screen. Can you? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Now yes, it's, you know, it's visible. You can see that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let me thank, um, first of all, Dr. Chilpi and um, uh, Dr. Samarjit. No, sorry, I'm wrong. Samarjit Yadav, it should be, anyhow. And uh, Professor. Thakur, who invited me to present uh, at um, MGAHV, I think I'm uh, using the acronym correctly. And uh, when I looked at the topic of the webinar, it really made me think once again, what are we doing and keeping my association with India which has been current and I've started my academic career in India. I studied there, I was born and brought up there. So I had to revisit the whole thing. A bit of literature, a bit of uh, the current practices. Uh, so more than what I'm going to share with you, it's, it's probably based on my thinking and a bit from my experience. Um, uh, speaking about myself as, um, Shilpi said, I come from School of Science, uh, Education and within education, we have Science and Mathematics Education Center. But at the same time in university, I'm, uh, I'm sharing 
other portfolio, which is Dean International and as Dean International, I uh, see students from different countries or I visit different countries and being from education, that becomes a passion for me to go and see what's happening. Many different types of experiences. Plus, what I heard since morning in the webinar, and I don't see that any of the experts is having a differing view than what all of us educationists believe in. Uh, what I see is missing is that initiative. And this, it has to be a significant initiative coming from the leadership. Probably all of us together, we have to push and see that uh, systemic change in the whole educational fraternity. So when you, uh, we talked about this assessment, I thought of assessment as a bridge. And this is a bridge I'm showing you from, um, again, a part in India, probably one of the most impressive bridges, and that too from your state of Maharashtra, which is connecting two parts of the city. And I see assessment as a bridge. What, but us educationists, what we have done to assessment or the whole education, we have compartmentalized it. We have compartmentalized it as curriculum, as pedagogy or whatever, teaching and learning. Pedagogy is a, actually a wrong word. It should be andragogy because pedagogy is used for beats, which are children. And then assessment. And what I am seeing happening in Indian scenarios specifically, and yes, whole world is, uh, you know, struggling right now because of Corona and COVID-19. All of a sudden, we had to go in lockdown. Even in our university, we struggled in the beginning, not School of Education, because School of Education, we have been running all our teaching and learning in fully online mode with thousands of students across the world, but other faculties really start, struggled to put their courses in fully online mode. And then the main issue was assessment. Same happened with India. Uh, as soon as we had to go under lockdown, teaching and learning was taken in fully online mode. But two months later, we started talking about assessment. And I don't think we are talking about assessment. We are talking more about evaluation and putting a mark on it. We are quantifying it. We are not looking at the quality. And that's why this conundrum has come in. So let's look at it in detail, What, how I see it. I think we were teaching like this and using a pedagogy, a pedagogy, and all of us are teachers here. So what, what pedagogy are we using here? And overnight, my teaching or any other teacher's teaching looks like this. When it has changed, do other things, our pedagogies need to change? That's a big question we need to ask ourselves. I, I read this wonderful um, book, uh, University Teaching in Focus, and it has theories and critique of theories. We do tend to go more into the literature, but not every literature applies to every situation. What could apply in one situation may not apply. So I would, I would really encourage you to read this chapter and see how theories are being critiqued and look for one or, you know, pedagogy, what, what will fit into your situation. 
that's really important for us to be as teachers, be aware of our situation and what applies to us. Uh, I was intending to run this session as a workshop, but I couldn't because of certain limitations, but there are questions around it. We tend to give a lot of information. So I just put a few questions together and ask you, 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 you can just read it and you, we don't need, or maybe go into the uh, you know, chat box and give me a, a response to this question. We, are, we can have a look at it later. And what is true? What's the right answer for these four or maybe three questions I'm asking here? Same way, a simpler question I may put here. So as cognition, how much load can we take or how many facts can brain process at one time? If we have answers to these, we would know what pedagogies to use and then how to set up even the assessments. And is assessment, oh, okay, I'll go to that later. And when we are looking uh, to this cognition, what, what are we wanting to happen there? Are we wanting to look at the prayer knowledge of the students? Or are we looking at the communication? Uh, what sort of communication is happening? Is our communication multimodal, which is definitely happening in current uh, you know, scenarios? Or are we engaging students? I think these, from the whole, these um, options, I felt and I believe that these are the four important parts for any assessment to set up. Prior knowledge or, or when it's, it's not only assessment, even teaching. What is the prior knowledge students are having? What sort of communication we are running? Is communication multimodal? And is it engaging for students? Moving on from there, I am a big believer of con constructivist pedagogies where students, the teaching is student-centered and students participate in active learning, where we dis focus on discovery, exploring and experimentation. And when it happens, running online assessments or alternative assessments is not difficult. We will believe in that. Are, are we running project work? Is it problem-based? Are students reflecting on their learning? And can they assess themselves? If, they are, if I have a, a proper rubric given to students when I give them an activity, can they engage in self-assessment? I think so. And uh, my students would do so. I, would, I taught... Um, um, assessment and evaluation for a few years before moving into the next role. And uh, the, I would ask them to self-assess and there would be part at times even peer assess and the mark or the grade given by them or their peers would not vary much between what I would give or when the assessment tasks were moderated. There wasn't any scope for much movement. Uh, am I working as a guide to scaffold student learning? And are we using diagnostic assessments to determine what students are, have, already know, which is very, very important. And communication skills and working with others has to be taught to students. What I did, uh, sorry, I can't again run with you Recently, um, I ran up my, you know, this um, Padlet program with students and asked them, tell me what effective teaching looks like for you. And I'll show you what students, they were anonymous. 
not showing. Yeah. Can you see this? These were the, can you see this? Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, these were some of the uh, st students. For them, this is how good teaching looked like. These are um, pre-service teachers. Engage students like this. And the, my question is, can I take it as a form of assessment, maybe diagnostic or formative assessment? And we have these tools available. Um, moving on from here. Or do I use a multiple choice question? This, this is very much sounds coming from India. If we have to go on to multiple, uh, sorry, online testing, we can, we can use MCQs. I'm not against MCQs, but a very dear colleague of mine, he did a lot of research, uh, David Trigast, if we, you'd Google his name, David Trickers did a lot of research around MCQs and what he found, uh, sorry, I have missed that, is that um, if we are running MCQs, we should run multi-tier MCQs. And I'll come back to that as well as I go. So what I want to see, why I set up, gave you the background, I want to see assessment as connected. I don't want to see curriculum assessment and teaching disconnected. And once we connect them, running assessment in online mode is not going to be difficult. We need to know what students have learned is and use uh, 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 find out what students have learned and use it to inform curriculum and teaching. And everything else should feed into it. Uh, your assessment should be valid, educative, explicit, fair, and comprehensive. I won't go into details of all this, but I can. Um, Yes, we have two types of um, referencing, norm referencing and criterion referencing. Um, I don't know if any of the Indian universities would be using norm referencing uh, assessments. Even here at Curtin, we use criterion referencing, which is we give them a criteria on the basis of which students would be assessed while as uh, there still are, I think some American universities which are very strong on norm referencing. That means we will have five students in 90% and next five in 80 or next five or 5% 5 in 70% range. Uh, since we are more focused on criterion referencing, I'll only talk about that, how we do here at Curtin as I go, uh, go ahead. Validity and reliability, how, why should we test it? Is do these assessment comprise the reliability or validity? Assessing students' football skills by asking them, write an essay, can we do that? If I want to test someone's skills to drive a car and ask them how you can drive a car, is that a fair assessment? From same way in teacher training, if I ask a teacher to write me an essay on how you will teach a student, that's not a fair assessment. Fair assessment is make them do teach it. And in online mode, you can easily do it. Ask them to teach. Uh, why should we be using, you know, jargon? in language and even in task sheets. 
as, as all of you would know, I won't spend much time on it. Diagnostic assessment is very important to know what students know before they, you start teaching them or assessing them. Formative assessment is actually teaching. It is assessment for learning. And that's the most important part of assessment. If we want to do assessment of learning that moves into the summative, and after this, we can't give any feedback to students. So most learning happens in the formative assessment. And if we could keep most emphasis on that part, that would be wonderful and lesser on summative. And we have lots of tools, online tools, which can be used for that. And I heard of some tools during the day, and I'll give you a few more. And Padlet is one of them, which I showed just now for uh, formative assessment. Coming to multiple choice, uh, one of the you know, questions is uh, in science, since I come from science, is about respiration. If I give this question to you, I'm sure 90% of you will give me a correct response. Then according to David Trigger's um, uh, research, which was done with year nine and 10 students, 80% got the first year correct. But as soon as he moved to Tier two, only 47 got it correct. And if we are choosing to go into multiple MCQs, I would strongly advocate that we don't have a single tier exam. So we don't have single tier tests. We, there are lots of double tier or even triple tier, uh, these tests validated, use them. That's the only way you can dig deeper into students' uh, knowledge of these questions. And you can use them. There are multiple platforms like um, Altrex and a uh, few others to develop these um, double, triple tier questions. That's, uh, and it's been tested that you, you can have a valid and reliable answer. And at the same time, you are really testing the knowledge, the deeper knowledge instead of hit and try. And this will let you know, why are you doing it? What you want to do? How would students learn? And how will you know if students have learned? Um, I'm not very, supporter of a single tier MCQ. The other bit which is happening very commonly in, uh, in this online mode is the flipped learning. Our university, we shifted to flipped classroom nearly five years back. There was a lot of resistance from academics, especially from uh, subjects like mathematics. How are, How can we, teach students in flipped classroom mathematics because students are supposed to do learning or I should say a task before they come to classroom and we don't run lectures, we call them workshops and it's been quite successful. But again, lots of thought will go into it and the classroom itself becomes a assessment space. And that space can be either in face-to-face -face mode or in online uh, environment. Uh, the difference I have said between the lecture-based approach and in classroom where, you know, eventually uh, um, the teacher or the facilitator he communicates, uh, asks questions, and collaborates with students. And it becomes, the collaboration becomes a teaching as well as an assessment platform. 
Um, I'm not going to show you, but again, this is a Trello board where I put some questions together and asked people to come out with responses to it. Again, a question around uh, assessment. Uh, assessment tools, I put a few together. Uh, I have used Kahoot very well. Uh, Boblas works very well and Canvas. There are quite a few uh, uh, around, uh, but tell you honestly, I haven't used, I have used Kahoot, you could try it, Boblas or even Canvas. Coming down, what do uh, what has changed pre-COVID or post-COVID? There was Sherman did give us the concept of pedagogy, content knowledge, and pedagogical content knowledge, which over time moved from PCK into TPAC because. In 1986, when Schumann gave the idea of PCK, we were not using much technology in our teaching and learning. And now we have come up with TPAC. And there is, in TPAC model, there is not one single way or one tool which can help us to do what we, we are wanting to do, especially with assessment. So with every subject, topic, probably, and based on the availability of uh, the technology, uh, you know, uh, you could choose a different tool. And, and there are many uh, freely available tools. And I've just put the difference between PCK and TCK and TPAC. Now coming back to Curtin University, what do we do? Um, we have, this is, uh, I've taken the snapshots of uh, our learning management system. We use Blackboard. All staff members are using Blackboard. They put, uh, this is about a chemistry um, experiment. They use uh, Echo 360, that means when a uh, lecturer is talking, everything gets recorded and then is posted, which students who don't come in face-to-face -face or are not attending even the collaborate session can watch it later on. And within Blackboard, we have collaborate. So everyone can see this. They prepare two sets. Uh, this is again about a chemistry experiment. This is how students will see what is required of them while they are doing that experiment. Um, and uh, this is again the Blackboard site. Uh, and they have within they have an assessment guide, but laboratory manual and the procedures given to them. They do it online and then they post the results there. And uh, there is discussion board as well. And they collaborate with their, uh, you know, lecturer. Uh, we use videos and we have found that videos is a very, very uh, impressive way of um, using assess for assessments. Uh, most students have, I should say, all students have smartphones. We ask them while they do an activity, take the pictures, post them on Blackboard so that we know exactly they are doing it. it it's one of the units. I'm not teaching this time and videos as well. And uh, so teacher has an 
evidence, practical evidence of what students are doing. And then they come up with the results, trial one, trial two, trial three, and it's all, I've taken screenshots of the Blackboard website. One more system which I see in India as well, some universities are using is IRIS. And here at Curtin, we used IRIS for, sorry, IRIS for a few years. Uh, but um, after COVID, we were advised by our IRIS is uh, since, um, the unit we were using it is um, has a higher enrollment rate of around 2,500 students, Iris would not be able to handle it. And it is an intelligent remote investigation center because system, there is lots of concerns in India, will students cheat? And all, if you want it to be invigilated because Iris can take the let invis uh, you know in which later even look at the eye movements of the students so we have not used it in this semester but in past students who would study from a distance were using iris this is one of the possibilities and that's what we need to think when i said we need to rethink assessments we need to think what will best suit our needs and uh, i think i'll leave you there and i would uh, yeah one more thing but it's very important for any assessment we need to develop a very concise and precise uh, rubric uh, which would be a rubric is not only meant for marking rubric is very important for students to know what is expected of them it gives them guidelines and in this at in the same tone it helps tutor to give a grade it becomes quite easy um, there are concerns about plagiarism and we we use turn it in although turn it in is not a plagiarism detecting um, program, but at least alerts the teacher to know what what is coming from literature and then make an informed decision based on that. Thank you. Any questions? I, I would encourage you to ask me more questions than me spending more time on uh, talking to you. Questions, please. Hello. Yeah. Shilpi Kumari, you can collect questions, see if there are some questions. Okay. Uh, to WhatsApp or maybe I will other... request, yeah. yeah. I will request the participant, those who have joined this session, uh, please ask if you have any queries regarding MAMS deliberation. Uh, Ma'am, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, how may the students, they may, uh, they may use rubrics for their self-assessment? How they can use it effectively? Effective, in rubric yeah. itself, you have said, um, you will get uh, uh, firstly any and rubric is very uh, effective in essay type of assessments so it could be in your essay how have you let, let, let's take example of a research proposal are aims clearly stated Cle uh, Aims are very clearly stated, are not clear, are not very clear, or are not clear at all. So you could give it one, two, and three marks. Then you come down to methods. You come down to 
um, you know, background, literature. So when you get it, it's giving direction to students, what are you expected to write in it? And uh, it's not only a guideline for students, it's also a guideline for the marker. But telling you honestly, if you're setting up an assessment, an authentic assessment, that's what we do. We generally ask students to write an essay based on their experience, which is, I'm talking about the teacher educators. It's if you if you will take at least two years to come up with a very appropriate rubric. First time, you may go to literature, you will, uh, you know, adopt and adapt based on that. But as you will mark the student's work, you will feel that language of my rubric needs reframing or as you go, you will find that some of the bits and pieces I have missed out in putting in my rubric, and you will like to reform it once or twice till you come up with a, a very good rubric. But once rubric is, I can't call it valid, but it's reliable, you, you as well as your students will find understanding the assessment task very easy and they will come up with a better product. It, it, a good rubric helps learning. And um, thank you. Do I make it clear? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. There is one more question. Yes, please. From Pankaja Kose. She's asking, what are which online tools we can utilize to create rubrics other than Google Form? Uh, which online? Yeah. I have never used online tool for a rubric. I have simply used a table. But there are sample rubrics on the on website. Uh, there is a rubric tool in Blackboard as well, as well as in Moodle. Yes, Moodle is very um, popular in India, and Moodle has a rubric tool as well incorporated in it. Thank you. One more question from Neeti yes. Bhatta. How assessment can be made more reliable in formative assessment? If it has all the elements of reliability, that means do all under the students understand it the way you have set it up. And again, if I have a good rubric to go with it, there are very little chances of students misinterpreting uh, the information required from these students. What happens is if I have one sentence statement for an assessment, different students can interpret it differently. But if I have a detailed information about what is expected of a student from an assessment, it is very unlikely that students will misinterpret it. So have a rubric to go with it, or if, if you're not, very comfortable um, giving students a rubric, give them a detailed information about what is expected of them. I would suggest develop a simpler rubric and give it to them with easy to understand language in it. Don't use any uh, jargon in it. Thank you, Pankaja. I have a question, ma'am. Yes, please. Hello? Yes, I'm listening. Ruchika. Uh, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I have a question, ma'am. Uh, it was a very good lecture of yours, ma'am, and very informative. But I have a query. Uh, 
that uh, i want to ask that till now we were always talking about the practical uh, practical knowledge rather than theory in fact we were always emphasizing upon the practical knowledge of especially in the teacher education field and mm -hmm. now again during this pandemic we are again uh, leading towards the theory and we are again talking about the assessment through various online tools and we are हेलो रुचिका रुचिका बर्मा आस्क योर क्वेश्चन हेलो रुचिका, वी हैव भास्कर चौहान ही इज आस्किंग अबाउट लार्ज स्केल इवेल्युएशन मैम मैम या रुचिका यू आर हियर यू मे यू मे पोज योर क्वेश्चन यस मैम या यस yes ma'am yes ma'am uh, i i repeat my question that till now we were always talking about the practical knowledge rather than theory that means we were always emphasizing upon the practical knowledge especially in the field of teacher education as she has uh, the pupil teachers have to face the actual classroom situation and now again we are leading towards the theory during this pandemic that we are all talking about the assessment through various online tools and we are only emphasizing upon the theoretical knowledge only uh, ma'am please share your views regarding this also that uh, how can we know about the actual skills of the students uh, who has to lead the actual classroom situations or uh, during his profession he has to uh, face the actual classroom situation he has to teach the future uh, generation of the uh, nation ruchika i'm really impressed this is a very pertinent question but as you would know we are right now in very uncertain times and uh, especially with teacher education it's it's not only teacher education any education any training both theory and practice go hand in hand theory is just for knowing the background knowledge but then what is important is the hands on knowledge working if you have to go and teach students you have to teach them whichever way and uh, what's happening right now we have transformed our classrooms into online classrooms so we are talking about online assessments we are talking about online pedagogy we are, that's why i talked about tpac model because we can't have online assessments unless i have the knowledge of pedagogical content knowledge in technolo technological pedagogical content knowledge how can we do it we don't know how covid is going to behave or how well we can handle it and we have covid today we could have something else uh, tomorrow very uncertain right now and world can't stop so can't the learning of the society which includes children right from um nursery till tertiary levels so should we have when we are talk you're talking about the things we are talking about right now is how can we transform the teaching and learning in a uh, online mode which does include assessment as well we are not talking theoretical knowledge we are talking practical how can we do it and that's how i understand it 
yes, we we do not need to know what are the theories. We do, we do need to know what is the technology available, but at the same time, how can we transform this technology or use this technology for transforming the, transforming the knowledge or transferring the knowledge, not transferring, transferring the knowledge. So it again becomes a practical avenue for students. Um, and we should be uh, skilled enough to do that. And that will come out of our experimentation and testing only. Some things will work, some things may not work. Some things will work for some teachers, some may not. Uh, like in our university, we look, as learning management system, we use Blackboard. I didn't talk much about Blackboard today because I knew none of the Indian universities use Blackboard. There are quite a few are using other uh, LMSs, so probably you will have to try and uh, use them. And it is practical. It is not theoretical, how I understand it. Uh, Ruchika, anything else? Uh, have I responded to your question? We have lost her. Ruchika, are you there? Thank you, ma'am. Sunanya, there is one more question from Sunanya Kadle. What are your views on open book exams for assessment in these times of pandemic? Uh, again, it, it depends. Uh, I'm not, uh, I am not against open book exams because it again comes to theory and its application. But how do we set up the questions? That's important. It's the art of setting up of assessments. If students or the examiner or the teacher sets up assessments where applied knowledge is required, open book exam is fine then again, it depends how long you make it, how much time you give to students. Um, it, it varies from assessment to assessment. I'm not um, against it. But it uh, again, I'm coming back to what, what's the type of assessment task you are setting up. Thank you. Next question from Indrajit Datta. Sir, what is your experience and tech take about incorporating sociocultural diversity in online embedded assessment system? Ah, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, uh, you know, world, world itself has become very diverse right now. Um, I've been interacting with Indian universities in uh, even NCERT quite a lot. And in any academic forum, India talks about their diversity. But when I look at the place where I am living in, in uh, Australia, we have people from 117 countries coexisting. And most of us are recent migrants or maybe second generation migrants. So world is a very, very diverse place. Yes, we, have, we are not traveling since COVID came into being, but there's a lot of mobility. And it is imperative that children of today will move quite a bit in their life. So it's very important that we expose them to different ways of living because that will that's the only way they will be encouraged to think or accept differences. What's happening in America right now is Black Lives Matter is probably a generation or few generations where 
taught to think in a very, very construed way of thinking, which we need to open up. That doesn't mean that one thing is better over the other, but they will have to accept different ways of thinking and different ways of living, which in, in a way in uh, metropolitan cities of India, children are or societies are doing very well. I am supportive of, uh, you know, introducing diversity in teaching and learning. And when you introduce diversity or diver uh, thoughts of diversity in them, you will automatically have them in assessments as well. And social cultural diversity is a very important part of our uh, living, way of living. And it's not only limited to India, it is worldwide, I would say. They don't only have to know the social cultural diversity happening in uh, what is existing in India, even the social, how world fun functions, world geography, world history, uh, thoughts about sciences, um, uh, concept of natural selection and um, uh, you know evolution. Both of them are theories. So leave it to students to accept it and introduce them. Yeah, I, I would promote it. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. You have clarified our doubts with much elaboration. Your deliberation was exceptionally thought-provoking. Um, I have, have a question. My... Yes. Um, good evening, ma'am. Um, it was a wonderful lecture and uh, um, um, uh, I just want to ask you, don't you think that uh, in this uh, pandemic uh, time, uh, economy is uh, uh, one side is affecting the haves and don't have. have. At the same time, the education is also impact, uh, uh, this haves and don't have uh, system of economy is impacting the education system also. Because in India, uh, most of the students as well as uh, teachers are underprivileged. They can't afford uh, gadgets as well as uh, online, um, 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 I mean, uh, platforms for assessment. Because I think uh, for using these platforms, uh, we have to pay something. Means they are um, not for free. So how can we uh, train teachers and how can we make these platforms uh, for assessment uh, um, affordable for the staff? Uh, uh, Ruchika, again, a very pertinent question. And uh, yes, it's very sad to see that poorer people have always suffered, always suffered in history. So have poorer countries as compared to some more, I would say, fortunate countries, people living in fortunate areas. Um, it's, it's sad and it's beyond our control. Um, but at the same time, I, I had a very encouraging uh, experience two years back in India when I started working in, through RIE Bhopal, where they had uh, brought some uh, tribal teachers. And uh, I had gone with a Moodle platform, uh, teaching resource uh, which we had put on Moodle platform. First day of workshop, I told them log on to the Moodle platform and they said, how do we do it? Um, next question was, I sent you a email and they're asking me their password for the, their email. This is their email and I had to give them they were expecting me to give them the password for it. Anyhow, we, I endured and we got along around it. Some of them, I would say 50 to 60% of these teachers would have seen computer for the first time. But 
95% of them had smartphones. They owned smartphones. I have whole statistics on that. And you believe me or not, first day I introduced them to what we have to do. Next day morning, as they are coming in, 100% of them had the website downloaded, the Moodle platform downloaded on their smartphone. And it took them maybe two or three hours to familiarize with the website. And after three hours, they were asking me smart questions. Uh, there are lots of resources like the Google platform we are using, Microsoft um, Teams, WebEx, which is a Cisco platform, and Moodle, if you have less than 500 users. I, uh, by the way, Moodle was developed by my colleague, or we were co-students together in Curtin and SMEC, Science and Mathematics Education Center, together. And uh, there are multiple resources which are available. Yes, they will need uh, uh, internet connection for which they will have to pay for either school provides it or their uh, university. I know government won't provide. Somewhere it has to come. It's, it's not a big expense, but it's very sad to see some will, some will be left out. But let's not let 100% of education students be left out. Reach as many as we can. That's, that's the stand we have to take. Um, but there are certain students, I'm sure we will be left out in this situation, which is sad and probably beyond our control. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Your deliberation has highlighted many important aspects about assessment and evaluation in teacher education program. First of all, we must be aware about our situations, our local context, prior to adopt any mode of assessment. Curriculum. Assessment and learning should be integrally connected into a coherent system. This should not, this three cannot be separated. Assessment should not merely focusing on grading the performance of the learners. Rather, it should be based on deriving descriptive feedback about the performance of the learners as well as the teachers so that both teachers and learners can improve upon their competences parallelly. We should be focused more on constructivist pedagogy inbuilt with reflective learning activities where the learners would get maximum opportunity of self-assessment. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your wonderful deliberation. Our next speaker, Professor Vanisha Denan, she is with us right now. Welcome you, ma'am. Hello, and thank you very much for having me join you today. Um, okay, ma'am. Is... Professor Vanisha Dhanan, let me introduce you, ma'am. Professor Danisha, Vanisha Dhanan, Professor of in Instructional System and Learning Technology, Florida State of University, Florida. She has citations of her publications around 4077, H Index 29. She's the author of famous books like Social Media for Active Learning, Engaging Students in Meaningful Network Knowledge Activities. She did her PhD from Indiana University, Bloomington, on the topic The Design and Facilitation of Asynchronous Activities in Wave Based Courses, Implications for Instructional Design Theories. She has received the prestigious awards like Transformation Through Teaching Award, Florida State University in the year 2015, College of Education Graduate Teaching Award, Florida State University in the year 2014, and so on. C 
He is currently the member of prestigious professional organization like American Education Research Association. In fact, there is a long list. I welcome you, ma'am, on the behalf of the School of Education and Mahatma Gandhi Antarashtriya Hindi Vidyalaya to this webinar. Let me invite Professor Vanisha Dhanan for her deliberation on the topic, Applying Open Pedagogy and Developing Renewable Assessment in Teacher Education. Over to you, ma'am, Vanisha Dhanan. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. And I am very happy to be with you today to talk about um, open pedagogy and renewable assessments in teacher education. I, I have some slides I'm going to use, so let me um, let me get those ready so I can share those right now. And let's see if this will work for me. Are you able to see my slides right now? No. Not... Okay, I, now yes. it's clear. Yeah, done. Done. It, it done. did work. Okay. Thank you very much for that feedback. I appreciate that. Okay. So this is the topic that I'm going to share with you this morning. Or sorry, afternoon for you. It is early in the morning for me here in the United States. Um, the overview of what I plan to talk about is um, to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about getting into the open mindset because it does require shifting the way that we think a little bit from traditional notions of education. Then I'll specifically get into open pedagogy and renewable assessments and describe what those are and give you an example of a, a rather large project that involved renewable assessments and hopefully get some ideas for you. As I begin, I want you to take a moment to think about what you um, what comes to mind when you hear the word open and in the online world we do tend to hear the word open quite a bit so it's quite natural for people to think that open is equated with online um, or free because often things that we use that are open are also at no charge to us although that doesn't necessarily mean that they are free and sometimes there can be money that's associated with it although I'm going to be talking today about open items that are free um, and there's also this idea that there's without restriction so that we are able to use this is another sense of things being free we are able to use whatever it is that we find without other people saying no that's not allowed no this will you know, violate copyright or you ultimately have to pay somebody for them when it when it comes to open then we get into this idea of open learning. And there's so many definitions of open learning that are out there. If you search for it, you will find many of them. But most people agree that the purpose of learning being open is that we are trying to broaden our access to opportunities for other people. And that could be through having universities that are open, courses, educational resources, or, or open pedagogy which is what I'm mostly going to be focusing on today, although the others, especially open educational resources, are going to be an important part of this conceptually. So let's quickly review through what these different items are. Um, in open education involves education that is free from barriers, so we don't have admissions barriers for our students. Um, we might get rid of the access barriers. We might make the format so that it's flexible. Um, they could be in different areas geographically, or they could students could pick and choose the modality of education that best meets their needs. Um, there may not be cost associated. Again, that's not always true. There are open universities that have free admissions processes, but do still charge students tuition to attend. Um, and they may be open from time constraints so that um, any regular constraints the school might put on, like defining a term, might be gone in an open educational system so that students can begin and end their studies and stretch them out for as long as they need to at their own convenience. Open courses then, it's just taking it down from the institutional level to individual courses. Those become courses that anybody could access freely online. Um, it may just be 
a course, a set of course materials in its entirety that becomes available. So there may not be any actual interaction with an instructor that is offered to students who enroll in open courses. Alternately, there may be. So if you're familiar with the MOOC movement, massive open online courses, that fits into this notion of open courses, and those do have instructors available for them. This brings me then to open educational resources, OER. And these are resources, so the things that we use in teaching. It could be reading material, it could be videos, it, um, it could be just about anything that we use in a classroom. It could be lesson plans even. Um, they are free from copyright restrictions. You can find them online and use them for your own teaching purposes. Alternately, and this is where I'm going to start talking about things with open pedagogy. Educators and students could be the creators and the sharers of these open educational resources. So the world of OER creates this economy of resources where there are people who are the creators, the producers, and the sharers of them, and there are other people who become the consumers of them. Somewhere in between all of that is this gray zone where you have people who are not the creators from the beginning. They go and they find what other people have created, but they are adapters or adders to existing OER. In other words, they take OER that somebody else made and they adjust them so that they're going to better fit the needs of a different learning population. And that becomes allowable because in the world of copyright, these resources have been licensed for other people to use under an open license. And what you're looking at on this slide are a set of different types of licenses that we can have for um, open educational resources. This comes from Creative Commons, and they allow people who are going to share the material that they have created to determine the conditions under which they're choosing to share them. So I might create something, for example, and decide that I want anybody else in the world to be able to use it and to be able to change it in the, whatever way they need to to suit their own needs. Um, but then I could decide maybe I don't want them to be able to do that if they're going to do it for commercial purposes. I may not want them to take it and sell it to other people and profit from my work. Or I might decide that that's okay. And these are all decisions that can be made with open licenses. So hopefully now you have in mind, we have these open educational resources, these little knowledge objects, learning objects, if you will, that are being freely shared with other people on the internet. And they have open licenses that are applied to them that let other people know exactly what were the rights that the original creator wanted to give to them. And that leads to the idea of open pedagogy, which becomes this teaching practice that involves students in this co-creation process, ultimately making open resources that other people can use. And this is a really different idea from um, what we regularly do in a classroom. We usually think of a classroom as being a space where things are fairly bound. The instructor is working from materials that they either created themselves specifically for that class, or they might be working from a set of materials that were provided by their institution or that have been purchased from somewhere else for use. And the idea is that those materials are used with that class and usually that they're not going to be used anywhere else. The students typically are not considered creators of learning materials at all, and they are doing whatever it is that the instructor has expected of them in the course. But they're very much following along rather than being active constructivist learners. No matter what type of open we're talking about, the basic concept of open is that there's some sort of sharing that is going to be taking place. And then that gets to the underlying challenge of it all, and that is figuring out what to do with the intellectual property. Going back to that idea of the licenses, 
who has authorship of something and who has ownership of something. And in the world of copyright, we do need to think about authorship and ownership separately. If you write a book, for example, and you publish it with a major publisher, you may be the author of it, but you no longer own it because you will have signed away a copyright to that publishing company. They now own it and they are the people who will profit from the sales of it. When we start talking about this economy of open educational resources and sharing them around freely, we need to push aside those regular notions of authorship and ownership. We may have multiple authors who are layering upon each other. If I create something and then you use it, you start to remix it and change it. You are somewhat the author of it and I am still somewhat the author of it. And then there's this bigger question of who owns it. And maybe we allow a third person to download it and use it in their class. And well, they own it, at least for their purposes when we're working in this open economy. Now, Hopefully this has given you a basic idea of open, if that's a new concept to you and how all of that works. Now I want to narrow down onto what this open mindset will mean in terms of pedagogy and assessment. So if we are to embrace open pedagogy and we are turning our students into knowledge owners and knowledge authors, um, this means that we are engaging the students directly in the learning process so that they are expected to be creating products as a result of it, not just repeating back and showing me as instructor what they have learned, but actually doing something where they can, can fully demonstrate what they have learned in a way that might be useful to the rest of the world. That leads to the concept of renewable assessment. Um, I like to use this definition of renewable assessment, which comes from David Wiley's work. If you're not familiar with that name, he has been a major player in the open educational resource and open textbook movement. Um, he was a professor at Brigham Young University in the United States, and he now is the head of Lumen Learning, which is a company that works with open textbooks. And the idea behind renewable assessment then is that at the end of our class, whatever the student did still has use in the world. It can be renewed for additional use beyond the classroom. And this is quite different from what we do in a traditional class and assessment process. So let's take a look at that for a moment. In a traditional class setting, our pedagogy focuses on just disseminating information to our students. So lecture becomes a very traditional form of teaching that we would use. Um, we also have our learning materials that give a lot of information to our students. So if students are engaged in reading, perhaps watching videos, and coming to class and listening to lectures, then all of the information for the class has been disseminated toward them. If we have a smaller class, we might be able to engage students in some sort of discussion. But even then, often the discussions are focused on um, dissemination and just having a check on did the students understand what happened there. Then the assessment, when we start focusing on students, is about repetition. Can you, the student, repeat back to me, whether that is on a test or on a paper, can you repeat back to me what was disseminated to you? My assessment is going to be whether or not I think that you heard and understood what I told you was important for you to learn. That's what happens in a traditional class. Now, this alternate approach if we start to embrace open pedagogy is that we focus on the students as creators. Uh, we're not taking away the role of the instructor as somebody who still needs to disseminate knowledge to the students. That's still a very important part of the cycle, but the instructor begins this process and provides access to all of the knowledge that's necessary in the class, the instructor doesn't always disseminate it all if we're working with learners in a highly um, digital environment. So if you have learners who are able to, on their computers, on their smartphones, to start to search for information, or they may have access um, in, in books even, 
then the students can be going out and gathering relevant information to their classes as part of that process. They're already starting to take ownership of it. And then the renewable assessment becomes something other than a test or a paper that an instructor will put a few check marks on and then, oh, right, what happens to it next? I bet you can all relate to this from all of your years as students. You probably had times where you spent an awful amount of time creating a paper, for example, for a class, and you get it back from an instructor and it just has you know, a check mark or a letter grade or number grade up at the top of it. And you think, oh, I spent hours and hours and hours on this. And how long did my instructor look at it for? You know, five minutes to put a check mark at the top of it. Um, that doesn't feel like all of my effort was worthwhile. With renewable assessment, because the creation can live on beyond the class setting, it starts to take on a more powerful role for students. Now, if you're wondering, well, what does this mean? What is a creation that lives on beyond the class? Let's think about this in terms of teacher education and what authentic outcomes might be. So if you're working with teacher educators, I, I teach a, or I oversee a class on um, technology use for pre-service teachers here at Florida State University. And I work toward authentic outcomes and assessment for that class. So we start with this idea of what do teachers do every day or what do teachers create every day. And that in turn informs what we want our pre-service teachers to be doing in their classes, what the assessments will be. So I think about them needing to learn how to create lesson plans and learning materials and learning activities and assessments. These are all the things that they will be doing when they become teachers. So the target assessment in the class would be to create these very kinds of things. The part about it that makes it open pedagogy and renewable assessment is the idea that it will go beyond just this class and have the potential to be shared and used by other people. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about how that will happen in a little bit because there are some issues to be concerned with such as quality control um, and I don't want to take away from that. Not everything that everybody creates really needs to be shared with the rest of the world. But first, I want to think about how renewable assessments can rely on TPAC knowledge also. And this becomes a very rich part of using renewable assessments in a teacher education program, which in turn helps prepare better teachers in our K-12 systems. So the TPAC framework tells us that it's not enough to just have content knowledge for what we're teaching. And, and this is a big challenge for teacher education classes because a lot of them focus on, well, this is the class where you learn the content knowledge, or this is the class where you learn the pedagogical knowledge. Um, perhaps this is the class where you learn the technological knowledge. But we know from this framework that the best instruction is going to take place in the middle zone when a teacher is able to use their content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, and technological knowledge together and they enhance each other to make an effective teaching and learning experience. So when we engage teacher education students in doing these authentic renewable assessments, when we ask them to do things like create open educational resources in the form of lesson plans and learning materials, what happens is they're drawing upon all of these knowledge areas and they're applying them all in that assessment. So they're getting some really good practice for being future teachers. The value then of doing these authentic renewable assessments is that it motivates students. Um, there's research that shows that students perform better when the audience for whatever it is that they're doing in class is broader than just their instructor. That always makes me a little bit sad to think that um, students are actually least motivated when they think that the only person seeing their work is their instructor. But that makes sense because when we know we have a wider audience, we tend to want to do our best work. We don't want to um, embarrass ourselves when we're doing things that other people will see. Um, students get to practice very directly what they're going to be teaching when they're teacher education students doing renewable assessments. They will ultimately have portfolios of work that they can take directly into the classrooms that they teach in in the future that they can use to help get themselves jobs. And 
the rest of the world can benefit from the things that they create if they're of sufficient quality. And that's really such a wonderful thing to have happen. So the approaches then to the renewable assessments to think about like, what are we going to do? Who are we going to serve with this? Uh, that, that you can have students create resources that will teach their fellow students so they can be creating things that you would use in that class. You might have a period of time where you have students work on something specifically to teach the other part of their class. Or you can have items that get taught by other, that, that are used by other classes. Um, it might be that you ask students in this year's class to create items that you might use when teaching again in next year's class. Or it might be that you ask them to create something that will then be used directly by a class that is at a lower level. So it could be reinforcing their own content knowledge. Uh, you might have students in a higher level teacher education class be creating something that could be used in the lower level um, class that's focused primarily on content knowledge. That's a very great way of doing things. Or even with a plan that, that they will be creating things that could be used um, down in, for example, a primary system or a secondary system, but they have a clear target that they are designing and developing for. Or you might be doing some sort of larger service project that is meeting the need of an entirely um, different entity. It doesn't have to be directly in your own um, institution or in a target primary or secondary institution. It could be something for larger service in the world. And I've, I've got an example that does a little bit of that as well. So the path then for doing renewable assessments is that you have this assignment for students. There's something that they need to create. It's usually not a quickly done assignment. It will happen across multiple weeks as, as most larger projects are. And um, there could be cycles in all of this. So the student creates something and then it moves forward to a stage where the instructor assesses it and the peers in their class can review it as well. And this is important because there can be a lot of labor that's involved with using renewable assessments, with doing something other than just a project, um, or sorry, than just taking a test, especially a multiple choice test. When you do a project, you can have the peers in the class learn how to be reviewers. And there's a lot of value in that because they are reinforcing their own learning when they have to provide critique or commentary to their classmates on the work that they have produced. They're also getting practice in leaving that kind of feedback, which we know is another um, teacher preparation skill that needs to be worked on in teacher education programs. It's not always a straight linear process, as you can see from this diagram, because after the student creates and then we have some sort of assessment, whether it's the instructor or the peers, and it could be peers first and then instructor, we can have these feedback cycles that go back to the student as the creator. So there can be some formative assessment loops in there until finally we make a decision, sort of moving on to the third phase, that we are going to take whatever was created, it has been reviewed, it's deemed of sufficient quality, and it will get shared with the world. Um, whatever we've decided is appropriate for the sharing for that context. Um, we don't have to share absolutely everything that the students have created. Of course, they are free to share themselves in whatever ways they like, but it can be um, set for students that there is a standard and the class will incorporate what they have created and share with the wider audience only the items that meet sufficient quality standards. And so this becomes its own metric of assessment and something to motivate students and have them work toward. I'm going to share with you an example now of a very large project that I did in this past spring. It also has some COVID-19 implications that I'll share with you because I think this is a relevant time to talk about these things. Um, and this was called the OER on OER project because it was a class on open educational resources and open learning. And the students were engaged in this process of learning about OER by creating open educational resources to help other people learn about open educational resources. I realize that gets a little bit confusing to wrap your head around at first because OER on OER is a complicated thing to think about. But the first several weeks of the course, I was teaching my students about what this whole world of open learning is 
and what the concept is behind open educational resources. And what the students started to say was, wow, I've never known about this. I wish I knew about this. I would have changed my practice as a teacher if I knew about open educational resources, or I would change my practice as an instructional designer. And the students said, this is something that other teachers need to know about and instructional designers need to know about. And also that we think um, people, we think that pre-service teachers should be learning about in their teacher education programs. So the challenge that I issued to my students was to create their own open educational resources that could be used to by other people to learn about or to teach about open educational resources. They took all of the things that they were learning in this class and they started to create on that topic. And what you are seeing now is a screenshot of the final product that the students created. It was a website that housed all of the open educational resources that they created. It's divided into different units and the students worked in small groups to produce content for the different units that are on this website. The website creates, um, contains a range of open educational resources that the students created, or in some cases that they remixed. So they may have found existing resources elsewhere and used those as a starting point and finally modified them so that they would fit with the overall open educational resource curriculum that we were creating. So what we were doing in this class is, as I said, creating the OER to help other people understand what OER was. And we decided on what our audience would be, that it would be instructional designers, instructors, and anybody who wanted to learn about the topic. We created, the, the, what you're looking at right now, by the way, are all authentic resources from the class. These are items that we created to help ourselves manage the process and understand what we were working on as a group. We decided what our learning objectives were for anybody who would be using the OER that we created. So we, we worked as a group to draft what the learning objectives should be. As the instructor, I was a part of this process, but I, I served more as a guide for the students to keep them on the correct path while they figured out what would be most appropriate to meet these learning needs. So the students are highly involved in creation. I was the expert on the topic, but I was not doing all of the labor for this. And we set out, because this was going to be a big project, not just one individual assignment that a student would do, um, to manage this through the key phases that we would do. So we started out by planning. This was done in a 16 week term. So by the time we spent the first two, three, four weeks working on learning the course content, not all of the course content, but we got a very strong foundation at that point. And then we started to plan. We figured out what format the project would take and who was going to design and develop what so we formed some teams. We developed design standards that we were all going to use so that if I have 20 different people creating items that they're going to look uniform. We then entered a development phase where we were building all of the OER using tools that we had decided on in advance so that everybody would be creating things the same way. We got into a testing process. We did quality assurance reviews. And this goes back to that feedback loop that I was showing you before, where the students create something, but then the peers and the instructors assess and they provide feedback. And then it can go back to the student who was the original creator so they could revise it and make it better. We then plan to hit a point where we would share with our local community and do what we were calling the soft launch to get feedback from other people who were in our department. Uh, now the date that's written on here is March 27th is an interesting date because about two weeks before that we were put on a stay at home order due to COVID-19 and that changed a lot of things for our class. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, then we had planned to do a launch with the broader community and at the end we would reflect on what we had learned. We decided that we wanted to become a design collective and that our authorship or ownership of what we created was going to be 
what we had done as a group. So we called ourselves the EME 5250 group and everybody's name in the end got listed on the work that was created because everybody had authored some parts of it and reviewed it and was taking part in the sharing process as well. Um, it, now it doesn't have to be done this way and people can, can do um, open pedagogy and renewable assessments by having students work independently and the students can be the authors of their own pieces and have their names directly on each piece that they create. But this was something that my class decided that they wanted to do because they put so much work into this, into doing a really good job. And they felt that even if one person started to create the OER, so many people had provided feedback and helped along the way with it, that the class owned what was created. We had to make a big decision about how we were going to license everything as a group. We chose a Creative Commons license and we decided we wanted to share very freely because we wanted the world to benefit from this. So we chose a license that was going to allow other people to not only use what we created, but to save their own copies of them and to modify them in whatever way they might want to, to use for their own instructional purposes. Then the students took what they created and they created a little advertising campaign for it and started to promote what they had made on social media so that other people could be, could be learning about their materials. And we also provided our editable resources. So for example, if somebody shares a video with you, your video is put on YouTube, you can use their video or not use their video, but you usually can't edit any part of their video. We decided to be truly open that we would provide all of the source materials that we had used on the website in the form of editable, res editable resources so that other people could, in fact, use these tiny components and recreate their own versions of the videos later if they wanted to. This was something that we had learned about as we learned about open educational resources. And so the students became very committed to making their what they had created available to other people in this way. Again, this was part of their learning process and I was able to assess that they had learned and really embraced the notion of open educational resources because this was something that they wanted to do. Now, the interesting thing that happened in this example with COVID-19 because we had to change what we were doing was that it gave us another opportunity, a different type of opportunity to engage in open pedagogy and to use what we were doing in the form of renewable assessments. We were not able to do the regular soft launch of all of the materials and share them with our local academic community because the event that we had planned to share at had been canceled. Everybody was staying at home. However, we found an undergraduate class in the pre-service teacher program that was about to learn for a week about open educational resources. And that instructor was not prepared to teach everything online in the pivot to remote learning that we had done. So this class stepped in and taught lessons for that week for that class. And that became part of their renewable assessment was to take what they had done on OER and suddenly create lesson plans and teach it. And now they have left that with the instructor of that class to modify and use again in the future. It also became apparent that these students had developed a lot of skills that would be useful for other people in that time. Everybody was trying to convert their classes to remote classes and it was a lot of labor. It was very difficult for people. And so I encouraged some of the students who were in positions to help others to apply the OER knowledge and skills that they had gained in the class in the service of other people to create resources that were needed. Some of them created content resources for other classes that built on open educational resources and some of them created resources that would help other people learn how to develop their own remote learning resources. For me to assess what they had done in the end, they took samples of their work, of what they had found, created, evaluated, and shared, 
and they put them together in a portfolio format. And that portfolio could just be a slideshow with visuals from what they had created and some sort of annotation explaining the role that they had played in it and how that fit in with the idea of open educational resources. And that allowed me to fairly assess all of them. One of the final concerns we had was to think about when the class ends, how does the project live on? In, in the several weeks since the class has ended, I have watched this project live on because I have had students take it and share it with other people in the places where they are working. Um, it's interesting because it's free for anyone to use, but people have come back and said, are you sure we can share this? And I say, yes, yes, please please do share it. But I have seen it traveling around in different online circles and we have had requests for, um, for other classes to be able to use it. And of course, it's all free for people to use. So it is living on in that sense. But my students also said that they weren't able to complete it um, to the degree that they had wished, that it still feels like the project could be added to and updated. And they asked me if I would keep everything that they had done and the next time I teach this class, if I would ask those students to continue to work on it and to further the project. And so that becomes another possibility with re renewable assessments that classes can, for future classes can continue to use them both to learn about the subject matter themselves and then to continue to build on those projects. So reflecting on all of this, um, Having that authentic audience is definitely a motivator for students to do their very best work. I know that the students in the class that I just told you about put in much more effort to do this work than they would have in a typical class if I had just asked them to write a paper or to complete a test for me. They needed, the students needed some guidance, they needed some parameters for what they were going to do, but they also needed the freedom to create. And they did some wonderful things that I hadn't even thought about because I gave them permission to go out and be owners and creators of the knowledge. The feedback loops were a very important part of this. And while I showed the students how to give feedback to each other and what to focus on, they really did most of the labor in that area. Because I chose in that example to do this larger group project, it was important for me to be a project manager as, as an instructor. So that is something that changes what an instructor does here. You're not necessarily creating and marking a test, but you do have to watch what the students are doing. You have to make sure there's enough time for them to do everything. You have to acknowledge that uh, this is the classic problem with group projects, isn't it? Not everybody will contribute equally. And sometimes you have to um, push students who are not contributing their fair amount. By using something like a portfolio at the end for an assessment, you actually can find out what different people have done. And the students who did not contribute equally will not have as much work to put in their own portfolio. And some will naturally become leaders and others will naturally be followers. And that's not necessarily a problem. In the time of COVID-19, I think renewable assessment is a really important concept for many of us to embrace because there are so many learning needs and knowledge needs that are out there. And we're finding ourselves needing to put the knowledge and create learning materials in alternate formats. The, this was something that you know, schools were not prepared for really at any level and they could use help to do this. Pre-service teachers are a wonderful group to pull into service here, uh, both for responding to a shift to remote learning during COVID-19, as well as for really any type of new educational initiative that we start, because they are needing to develop these skills related to managing a classroom, so creating lesson plans, creating learning materials, but they're also in a privileged position um, at a university with the access that they have to faculty members that they could be creating items that if, of sufficient, if of sufficient quality that they could be in turn shared out in the school systems for primary and secondary school systems and be meeting some of the needs that we have there. If we do um, renewable assessments at a large scale, then we are bringing in that TPAC model so that we incorporate content pedagogy and technology needs. Um, this can be part of capstone course experiences for students. Um, 
we can think about doing these group or class projects to meet defined needs that exist in the world. So if you are, know that you're teaching a class on a topic and you know somebody who has a need for something related to that topic, the students can work on that for those people. You, engaging students in peer feedback of each other's work helps prepare them for learning how to evaluate and assess for when they get their own classrooms. And again, it is possible to be developing projects across classes over time where what one class creates meets the knowledge needs of another class as some sort of learning archive, but also becomes a legacy that those future students can be building on and making the resource even better. And I have seen this happen in classes where they start one semester to create a book for the class, an open book, and then students the next semester come in and they build out the book even further and, and so on. And because most of the areas that we teach in our living areas, the knowledge is always changing, developing, and growing, there's always some work for that next group of students to do. They learn from what was done before and they add to it and make it even better. So some of our potential benefits when we do this in teacher education are building collections over time across classes of learning objects, of, of open educational resources, um, and meeting the needs of other people. We are also teaching these future teachers about open educational resources. So they learn about creating and sharing them and valuing them and using them. And that leads to potential cost savings in the future. If we have teachers out there working in the world who are aware of OER from all angles, then we hopefully have teachers who will start to embrace them and use them. And that can save a tremendous amount of money on textbook and other learning material costs. As these future teachers learn all about this and about knowledge ownership and authorship, this is information that they will in turn pass down to their students in those primary and secondary settings, which creates a citizenship that is much more aware and adept at working in this area. So as I wrap all of this up, what I want to do is to issue a little challenge to all of you to think to yourselves, you know, what in this world of open is it that you can do? And how might you be able to incorporate some sort of renewable assessment into whatever courses you teach? With that said, I thank you very much for attending this talk and I would be happy to use the rest of the time that we have here this afternoon to um, engage in discussion with you about this topic and um, to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, ma'am, for your accept exceptional and excellent deliberation on a vital theme like renewable assessment. You emphasized on very pertaining points, like students should also be considered as creators. They, they can also be the creator like educators of OER resources. OER resources should be linked with open license, which allows the others to use our intellectual work without any restrictions. Thus, this opens the space for more sharing and collaboration. Um, let me be very honest. For me, what I could understood from your deliberation, uh, that it has changed my assumption, in fact, that every student's work, every student creation has some worth for the institution as well as for the society. And any student's work should not be discarded. It was something very new to me. Um, we have some questions from the participants. They are eagerly waiting for uh, the clarification um, from your side, ma'am. I'm just posing their question. Jyotsna Kohli, she's asking, how could renewable assessment be included in the existing curriculum? In order to um, include renewable assessment in the existing curriculum, it um, takes an instructor who wants to um, put forth the time and effort to start 
a project with their stu students on renewable assessment, but there are so many ways that we can, can do this. Um, just identifying that opportunity to create something that other people will need. The first step is really to decide what is it that potentially needs to be created. Is it better learning materials for the class that you yourself are teaching in the curriculum? Is it something that might be used by a class that is at a lower level from the current students who you have? Is it something that might be used by current in-service teachers or something that might be used by um, you know, people out in society somewhere? Who would the target learners be for whatever resources that a class would create? And you know, from there, you can just encourage students to be creating these items. Uh, now, what an individual student creates may not be a very large item itself, but if a whole class is doing a project, that is when you create something much bigger than that. You might have um, a small group of students. You might have three students who are working together and what they create might be a lesson plan that a teacher could use to teach a target topic, or they might create a three minute informational video on a topic that um, we need information on. I, I knew somebody who was helping, who was working with students to create open educational resources related directly to COVID-19 um, because they recognized that there was a need in a particular population. And so they were having students create resources on things like appropriate hand washing and how to wear a mask properly. And that was something that fit with the topic of their class um, because they were touching on medical sciences. And so it was an appropriate thing for those students to be doing. But there are a lot of possibilities. It just takes stepping back a moment from the type of pedagogy and assessments that we are so used to doing and looking for those opportunities. I will add that um, the first time you do something like this, it can be, um, it can feel a little bit nerve wracking. You might want to see if you have support from the other people around you to do this because it, it looks different and it feels very different from things that have been done previously. Um, but usually if you can show that you are asking students to do something that is going to meet a need of other people, you will start to find that there, that the other people around you, your peers as a faculty member, for example, your institution will say, okay, let's try this because I see it has some sort of larger societal value. We'll see what happens. And you can say, if it doesn't work out, if my students do not produce really good and worthy work, then we don't have to share it with anybody. That's okay also, but they will have still tried to work toward that point. Um, so there is a safety net there. It doesn't mean that everything the students create will automatically get shared. Everybody feels a little bit better when we have that safety net in place. And what I have found though, is that most of the time the students create things that are worth sharing. And once we've done one cycle of this, people locally start to value it and say, we should do more of this because it's such a rich learning experience for the students who are in the class and creating the OER and the people who are using what we have created are also receiving value from this. Thank you, ma'am. We have one more question from Praveen Shah, Odisha. Please elaborate how we may use renewable assessment approaches practically in our day-to-day -day practices. Um, how we can use them practically in our day-to-day -day practices. Well, and there are two sides of this. Um, there's using the renewable assessments to actually assess our students and then using the outcomes of them in our future teaching and learning, learning endeavors. And it really goes back to this idea of finding situations where there is some sort of knowledge need or learning object need that we have 
And when we identify that, then we can ask current students to become the experts on that topic and to fill that need. And I think that, that as instructors, we can all identify those places in our curriculum where it would be nice to have something extra. It might be nice to have a study guide. It might be nice to have some sort of synthetic video on a topic or it, it doesn't really matter what it is and once we have students create it then on our practical day-to-day -day, um, work we can use it the next time we go to teach that topic it become can become built right back into that same class as part of the curriculum we can also just be using all of this as consumers so you know one option is to not have students creating big things on their own if you want to start small there's a lot that other people have created out in the world we can ask students to go find the open educational resources that exist on a topic already and then just make a determination if those are suitable for our own teaching and learning needs or if they need to be modified or built on in some way to meet our teaching and learning needs. So students could be brought in not as the initial creators, but as the remixers of something. And that could be a very practical way of starting to integrate renewable assessments into the curriculum. Thank you so much, ma'am, once again for your wonderful deliberation, quite enlightening to us. I and my colleagues will be trying to incorporate renewable, renewable assessment activities in our curriculum of teacher education program. Thank you so much for being with us, ma'am. Now, Thank I yes. Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I request the chair of the session for his, for his presiding remarks on the deliberations which has happened so far in this session. Professor Amrit G. Kumar, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Shilpi Kumari. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, both the speakers, uh, uh, Professor uh, Rekha, Vanessa Dunnan. Uh, I'm so happy that both the speakers were so um, so eloquent in their presentation. They have presented their ideas very clearly, and uh, I'm sure that um, uh, Rekha Kaul was speaking about uh, assessment, and she gave emphasis upon self-assessment. You know, a teacher or a teacher educator who wanted to assessment needs to give a lot of trust and confidence on their own trust upon the students. That's a great thing that she has emphasized upon self-assessment of the students. And uh, her, her lecture was, in fact, a, a kind of a talk about online testing and then about and the, 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 the multiple choice questions. And then, and then, uh, then she talked about flipped classroom and even she, speak, speak, she spoke about uh, online uh, assessment and different apps like Kahoot and so on. It was really interesting. And uh, while It was excellent. It was an excellent deliberation. I really enjoyed I'm sure that all the participants across the country uh, would have been enjoying it. And she was speaking out of her own experiences, running a project, and then sharing the success of the project with uh, you know, people over here in India. We really appreciate your initiative on that. You are, you are, you are kind heartedness in sharing your great project and then very interesting project with the, with the fellow colleagues, with the fellow uh, professionals here in India. And, um, you know, the project, the way she has designed it, the way she has uh, 
way she's documented it all seems to be quite interesting and quite professional. I really appreciate for that. And what I could see in both the lectures together when I was just trying to see, to see that what is running through these two lectures is that, you know, uh, when Professor Vanessa Denon, Denon was talking about, you know, uh, giving the role of a constructor for the, or the creator for the learner in creating open resources uh, and so on. And of course, uh, Professor Rekha Kaul also was speaking about the emphasis, the importance of the student as an as an important person in the whole system of education. So what I could see common in these both lectures is that both of you have emphasized the student as an important important person or, a, or an important component who could construct knowledge, who could who could be relied, who could be trusted. Uh, in the process of education, I really appreciate that that attitude of both um, that attitude, which was explicit in both the lectures, and I'm sure that all the participants across the country uh, would have enjoyed it. And I'm sure that uh, the projects and the wonderful ideas proposed by both of you will be carried forward, and sure that we'll be uh, in constant touch and hope that. Uh, will turn out to be a great event and great you know continuous process uh, in the whole india thank you so much uh, professor Kakaul and then when you said denen and i thank uh, uh, professor gopalakrishna thakur uh, professor shirish and the colleagues over there in uh, mahatma gandhi andarashtri hindi vishwavidyalaya for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, resource persons inviting them to uh, to uh, to this webinar for the uh, for the for the but for the benefit of our uh, our fellow professionals. Thank you. I thank both uh, the speakers. I thank the whole coordinators. I uh, thank all the um, participants. Mahatma Gandhi uh, under Rashtri Hindu Hindi Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Amrit Ji Kumar, for your enlightening feedback on the deliberations of this session. Now, this is the time for formal vote of thanks. Let me take this opportunity to extend my hearty thanks on the behalf of School of Education and Mahat and MGHV Vardha to the resource persons for their insightful and thought-provoking deliberations. We will definitely be trying to accommodate the interventions suggested by you in our practices and also try to contextualize them according to our needs and circumstances. I am very thankful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Rajneesh Kumar Shuklaji. Besides being a visionary administrator, he is also a great academician, having knowledge of various disciplines. I am thankful to Dr. Gopal Krishna Thakurji, director of this webinar, Dr. Siris Pal Singh Ji, organizing secretary of this uh, webinar for giving the, me this platform, this opportunity to coordinate this session of the workshop, sorry, webinar. I'm very thankful to my colleagues for their wonderful cooperation during this session. I'm also thankful to the technical team for their technical support all throughout this technical session of the webinar. I am very thankful to all the participants for their patient listening and insightful questions throughout the session. Thank you all. With the permission of the chair of this session, Dr. Amrit Ji Kumar, I announce the closer of this session. We will meet again tomorrow, 16th of June, 2020, start at 10 a.m for our third technical session on the theme, Crisis, Alternatives, and Innovations in Assessment. Our speakers would be Dr. Fazia Abdul Rahim, College of Arts and Science University, Malaysia, 
Professor K. Srinivas, Nipa, New Delhi. And this session will be chaired by Professor C.B. Sarma from NIOS, New Delhi, Noida. Till then, thank you and stay well.